Welcome to EPG Patshala. My name is Ipshita Chanda and I teach comparative literature at Jadavpur University. In this module, we will be discussing the poems of Christopher Okigbo, who is a Nigerian poet and a romantic figure in the Anglophone African literature. We will begin with an overview of Okigbo's life and the circumstances that inform his poetry and follow with an analysis of some of his poems chosen to reflect the central themes and concerns that Okigbo espouses. Christopher Ifikandu Okigbo was born in 1932 in Ojoto, which is 10 miles southeast of Onitsha, situated on the banks of the river Niger. Ojoto is a rural community and the river Idoto runs through it. There are also two shrines which are held to be very holy at Ojoto. These are the shrines of Idoto and that of Ukpaka Oto. This perhaps explains the use of the Igbo pantheon and the striking presentation of the connection between the present state of man, nature and the gods which characterize Okigbo's poetry. Okigbo's father was a traveling teacher and a headmaster working across the local missionary stations. He was a member of the Roman Catholic mission. His father used to live in the mission stations which were located in various places across Igbo land. In the early poems of Okigbo, we can see traces of this travel. Okigbo lost his mother at the age of six and after that he was looked after by one of his mother's relatives who was named Eunice. Eunice was a very good storyteller and this had a lasting influence on the young Okigbo. Apart from this, his father's occupation also had an influence on Okigbo, primarily doing his, during his growing up years. In the first place becomes clear that Okigbo was the product of Christian missionary education and as the child of a missionary school headmaster, he lived in two homes. The home that was dependent on his father's posting and the home that he inhabited in the village during term time. In both these homes, there remained a basic difference between the children of the missionary English educated teachers and the other children of the village. The children of the teachers lived and studied in the mission stations. They were also aware of the village activities like festivals, songs and dances in which they participated frequently. These children therefore had the experience of both the traditional life and the colonizers way of living. Okigbo's literary career stretches approximately over a period of 10 years between 1957 and 1967. This include both the last few years of colonial rule in Nigeria and the immediate post-independence period which in Nigeria was marked by the Biafran civil war. Okigbo was killed in the civil war in September 1967 at the age of 35 at the Ensuka sector in eastern Nigeria. This is the life that informs the poems of Christopher Okigbo, to which we now turn. Through Okigbo's poems, the reader can distinctly understand the development of the poet's mind. The hallmark of his poetry lies in his ability to synthesize the inner spiritual realm with the social realm. His poems are thus able to present the complex forces shaping experience of society and culture at the time of the contact between colonizer and the dominated colonized, which then gave way to the painful process of a nation's birth. Okikpo recreates the past in his poem, exploring the true relationship between the individual and his past. He strongly believed that the root cause of many of the problems which modern Africa faces is due to her loss of connection with this past. And one of the purposes of his poetry, therefore, is to re-establish this connection. This connection with the past is necessary because he knows that his generation had been dominated by Western culture and Western education. And so they are severed from the traditional past that they inhabit. The indigenous culture of the people 
has been suppressed by the domination of the Western value system. The deep meaning and power of rituals, therefore, occupy a significant place in his poems. Uruba, Igbo and Ashanti praise songs and drum invocations resound in his poetry. Okigbo uses the heritage of the English literary tradition to bring the depth and power of his own tradition to the surface. Scholars point to the influence of Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot in his poetry. Many of his poems employ correspondences between the world of the senses and the spiritual world, therefore using a number of symbols that stand for this connection. His poems embody the mystery of life and death, the individual's identity and his relation with both the living community and the spiritual world. Let us consider some of the major works of this poet who lived a brief life of 35 years. His early poems were published in the University of Ibadan student publication known as The Horn and then in the literary journals Black Orpheus and Transition. His collection of poems called Heaven's Gate was published in 1962. In 1971 appeared another collection called Labyrinths. In the introduction to Labyrinths, Okigbo remarked that although the poems were written and published separately, yet there is a kind of coherence among them. There is a thread that runs through them. In almost all his poems, there is the poet protagonist or the central figure who makes his journey through a series of interrelated though discrete experiences. This journey inevitably has a quest motive and there is the recurrence of definite symbols and images which provide a mythic coherence to his poetry. Due to this recurrence of images and symbols, Okigbo's poems often tend to become difficult and sometimes incomprehensible to his readers. Often, his works are considered to be obscure. But most of his poems are aimed inward, seeking and restoring the unity of his being in the time of violent mental colonization and its equally violent aftermath. Okigbo's mythopoic imagination made him transcend the given event by seeking a connection with the mythical past through symbols. This helps him to derive a poetic statement and not a mere comment or a description of an event. Okigbo's Song of the Forest is considered to be his oldest extant poem. It was written in 1957 in Lagos. This poem has been considered to be a result of his studies in Latin and primarily his reading of Virgil's Eclogues. It is generally believed that the poem is an adaptation of the first verse of Virgil's first eclogue called Tityrus. This poem gives him the opportunity to reflect from Lagos on his village home where he could view a life of ease in the open air. He says, You loaf, child of the forest, beneath a village umbrella, plucking from a tender string a song of the forest. Here, he shows the village environment and juxtaposes the life of the poet protagonist with that of the child in the village. In contrast to the village child, the poet protagonist is a runaway. The poet also emphasizes the element of compulsion when he says that this child must leave the borders of our land, fruitful fields must leave our homeland. This nostalgia for the village environment is a direct result of the following of his model, Virgil. But he uses this village setting and environment to reflect upon the feelings and position of the modern poet. He provides an instruction with this poem that it should be accompanied by an ubo, which is a local hand piano, indicating the poem's connection to songs sung in the traditional way. Another of his poems, Moon Glow, is the retelling of an Igbo children's story. In the story, the dark image that we can see in the full moon is that of a person who went to work on Sunday and was punished by being given wood to heave forever. 
Okikbo's first major publication was Heaven's Gate and it was considered to be an important development in the history of Anglophone African poetry. Regarding the poems which comprise Heaven's Gate, Okikbo himself said that they are like the ceremony of innocence and an offering to the river goddess Idoto. He also remarked that the poetic personage is like Orpheus, who is about to begin his journey. Both these poems reflect the juxtaposition of the classical European tradition through the Orpheus myth and the indigenous worship of Idoto, the river goddess. This also shows the religious and mythical traditions that inform the poet's imagination. Heaven's Gate has four sections or movements called Passages, Initiations, Lustra and Newcomer. These movements have sections within each of them and thus the book presents a complex web of movement within movement. This complexity articulates the alienation of the poet from his indigenous culture and the process through which he seeks to comprehend this culture. The first poem, Idoto, presents the poet as a prodigal since he has been dominated by European values and Western culture. He has been separated from his indigenous culture and hence he needs to unite his newly acquired Western values with that of his indigenous culture in order to create an all-encompassing sensibility for himself. The poem with its figure of the humble prodigal and the watery presence of the goddess provides a context for the rest of his poems in this collection. Mother Idoto, the river goddess, is the muse whom the poet has invoked and he confesses to her in an innocent manner that he is a prodigal. He realizes that he requires support and hence leans barefoot on the oil beam which is the legendary tree of knowledge and waits patiently for the watchword of heaven's gate. The poem Passage 1 which occurs in the collection Passage and Other Poems begins on a biblical note with the dark waters of the beginning. The slim rays of light which the poet sees can be interpreted as the combination of indigenous and Christian faith and the symbol of both destruction and mercy. The poet says, on far side a rainbow, arched like boa bent to kill, foreshadows the rain that is dreamed of. The rainbow is the Christian symbol for the covenant between God and human beings, which promises that God will never again destroy the world by flood. Again, in the traditional Igbo worldview, the rainbow is associated with the yawning of the dangerous boa constrictor, which is here described as bent to kill. Thus, the poem tries to present the confrontation and the resolution of the Christian and indigenous faiths. In a nutshell, passage 2 describes the poet's boyhood at the smithies, which can be the various institutions like the missionary schools where he received formal education but it can also be the traditional training of the Igbo village through which children are inducted into their society and learn its myth and history. Passage 3 describes the ritual of church services. The poet here points out that the message of the Christian gospel is to impart joy. Those among the colonized who embrace the Christian faith, however, cause grief because in reality they are abandoning their indigenous culture and faith for the sake of the new culture. In passage 4, the readers hear the sound of the boots, the powerful premonition of the colonial presence, of the European occupation in Africa. Initiation shows how the poet's introduction to this new faith resulted in agony and sacrifice. The onslaught of the new faith compelled him to lose his own old self. The poem Water Maid presents a solitary child mourning for his dead mother. This water maid 
can also be another form taken by the goddess, who is the muse of the poet. In Heaven's Gate, the poet shows the need for a new journey of self-discovery for the prodigal, the child lost to his traditional world through the contact with another faith and another culture. When such a child wants to return to his original home, his journey must begin with a cleansing. This cleansing entails the restoration of a unified personality. Heaven's Gate ends with the movement called transition. The images and symbols used here have a link with his next collection of poems called Limits, published in 1962. In this latter book, Okigbo reunites with his indigenous culture as a step towards achieving his goal. The poem Bridge introduces the poet who is standing above the noontide with the water flowing under him. This image reminds the readers of the cross. It tries to drive home the fact that the seeker has not completely submerged himself. Therefore, total illumination and knowledge are not possible. The poet seeker thus sits on the bridge and gazes at the heaven where stars will fall from. The bridge is a symbol joining the two states of his experience. The appearance of the water maid and that of the stars are similar as both provide illumination to the poet. But it is difficult for the poet to grasp both of them since they evade his view. The final grasping of the water maid occurs in distances which reveals completion of a spiritual and artistic journey in which illumination serves as a constant image. In limits, the poet tries to resurrect the indigenous culture of his community. His poem, Fragments from the Deluge, describes how the indigenous culture was partly destroyed and partly suppressed by the culture of the European colonizers. The Christian missionaries and the colonizers are presented as predatory eagles who descended and swooped down and destroyed the indigenous cultures and traditions of Africa. The sunbird had already foretold that the arrival of the European eagle will mean doom for African cultures. According to the poet, the most painful and disheartening is the denial of the local and indigenous value system and the way of life, including the desertion of their gods by the people after the colonial occupation of Africa. So the poet says, and the gods lie in state without the long drums, and the gods lie unsung, and the gods lie veiled only in mould behind the shrine house. The poet emphasizes the fact that the gods are lying neglected, but they will never die. This view that Okigbo holds reveals the idea of resurrection of his indigenous culture in the face of all odds. This reawakening of the culture is nothing new, just as the growth of the branch of the giant fennel tree is not a new thing. After the resurrection of the gods of the indigenous culture, the sunbird again returns to life. The sunbird sings again. The poet's search is for both spiritual and moral illumination. He seeks an identification with humanity in general and the pronoun through which the speaking voice represents itself thus changes from I in limits one to he in limits two and finally to we in Limits 3. Limits opens with the chatter of the weaver bird. Distances takes all the conflicting elements of the poet's experiences and moves towards a resolution. Okikpo has finally identified himself with his indigenous culture. He is able to end his quest and thus it is only a short step through some dark labyrinth which will take us to the birthday of the earth. The journey is thus from laughter to dream. Okikpo's poem, Lament of the Drums, is inspired by the imprisonment of the Nigerian leader, Awolowo, and the tragic death 
of Avalovo's eldest son. The poem begins with an invocation derived from the music of Ashanti drummers. In the introduction, Okigbo mentions that these drums are the spirit of the dead ancestors and their invocation is to the elements of which they are made. There is also a prayer that war should not intrude. Section 2 of the poem provides us with the message of the drums. Section 3 describes the death of Palinurus, who is betrayed and murdered. The comparison is with the betrayed Nigerian leader Avolovo and his son, who were killed in a car crash. The middle section of the poem is the only instance where the drums do not speak. Instead, we find here the lament of Palinurus and the sea into which he was cast. The poem creates a dramatic self-exclusion, lending a distance to the poet as he comments on the political situation of his country. Section 4 again comes back to the drums. The drums now lead to the lament for the crops, the people and the great river, which certainly refers to the river Niger. His method in this poem was to create the drums and then allow them to say what they wished. The lament of the masks derives its imagery from the Uruba Oriki and is a praise song for the Timi of Ede. The poem consists of many images of violence lending credence to the speculation that the violence in post-independence Nigeria helped to ignite Okigbo's imagination. Then the lament of the silent sisters talks about the Western Nigerian crisis in 1962. The poem signifies a departure from Okigbo's quest for cell to the political condition of his country. In the dance of the painted maidens, Okigbo creates pure sounds. The repetitions of phrases and the use of vowels and consonants give the poem a unique melody. After she had set sail, after she had set sail, after the mother of the earth had set sail, after the earth mother on her onward journey. Like most of his poems, this one too creates a pattern with the words, which contrasts a situation of absence of the mother earth with what one can achieve when Mother Earth is present. Thunder can break and other poems. Thunder can break describes the coup of 15 January 1966 in Nigeria. The unyielding attitude of the previous regime led to this military coup. Come Thunder is considered to be neither an elegy nor a celebration, rather the poem cautions the readers that the coup has not been the last of death dealing because, as the poet says, the death sentence lies in ambush along the corridors of power. In Elegy for Alto, Okigbo considers himself as the horn that will pour the air howling goodbye. He is also the sacrificial ram into whose heart the sword will be plunged. This poem thus seems a premonition of his death and, and is considered in hindsight to be an elegy for himself. We have tried to analyze the themes and the forms of Okigbo's poetry such that we have a deeper insight into his poetic oeuvre. Most of his poems present a search that is revealed through the metaphor of a journey. The journey as a metaphor is very important as it reveals the spiritual, artistic and intellectual search of the poet. This personal search expands to include the search of the human being for his roots in the past, in nature and in myth and for an integration among them. Thus, this quest moves from the personal level to the public, the tumultuous political events in Nigeria from the end of 1965 to the beginning of 1966 helped Okigbo to write his most admired poem called Path of Thunder, Poems Prophesying War. It was published posthumously in 1968. The poem illustrates Nigeria's irrational and absurd 
post-colonial situation, forcing political and economic conditions which ultimately led to the military coup in 1966. This was followed by the massacre of the Igbos and other Eastern Nigerian nationalities in many parts of the country. This resulted in the exodus of many Eastern Nigerians back to Eastern Nigeria. The poem not only describes the terrible nature of these events, but also cautions the readers about their consequences. The military has taken power in Nigeria and Okigbo states that drums, wooden bells, the iron chapter and the dividing heirs are gathered home. Okigbo could understand the divisive politics of ethnicity and religious faith which were responsible for the catastrophic socio-political situation of Nigeria. He was also able to comprehend that this situation would spell disaster and doom for Nigeria. Path of Thunder is his last communication through poetry with both the world at large and with his own countrymen. What is the relation between Okikbo's traditional world and the modern African world that he inherited? As readers of Okikbo's poems, we find that his poetry sought to reveal the divided sensibilities of the new African elite. This, no doubt, is a modern issue that plagues the African elite even in contemporary times. According to the poet, the divided sensibilities cannot unite unless the past culture and the present culture of the Africans are reconciled in the proper way. Thus, his poems constantly try to move into the past and resurrect the indigenous culture of his people since this would only lead to the reconciliation between the past and the present. The role of the poet as assigned by traditional African society is to celebrate the community and its worldview. Through this celebration, the spiritual and the material being unite. Okigbo, as a product of modern society and of Christian education, is aware of the fact that the modern world and the spiritual world and the material world are not divided due to the advent of Western value systems and missionary education. Okigbo, therefore, brings out his own insight regarding the convergence between the spiritual and the material. Thus, we see that through the image of the sunbird, the poet tries to warn the people against the dangers of the influence of completely succumbing to Western values. In the process of assimilating the West, the sunbird is ostracized, as we see in the poems of Heaven's Gate. This issue of the divergence between the past and the present due to the colonial intervention gives his poems a kind of universality that appeals to readers. Okigbo was once asked in an interview about what he thought of himself as an African poet. He replied that he was only a poet and a poet is only a person who writes poems. It is for his readers to decide whether he is an African poet or an English poet. The implication is towards the universality of his poetry which appeals to the reader in modern society. Okigbo's poems have the ability to raise various issues to ponder upon. Is poetry to be treated as a ritual or as a religious mystic activity? Is poetry to be considered as the personal expression or the expression of the community? These poems articulate such questions through a lyricism that is effected by capturing the rhythm of specific musical instruments and through the intense personal vision of past and present. Okigbo only raised these questions because in his short life of 35 years, he did not have the time to consider them any deeper. But he brought myth to illuminate and represent and question history. For a detailed reading of his poems, and, and you could refer to Modern Poetry from Africa, edited by Uli Bayer and Gerald Moore, to read Okigbo's poems for yourself. Thank you.